Hey, aloha and welcome to Stan the Energy Man on another really beautiful day here in Hawaii. I'm Stan Osterman from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies, part of the state of Hawaii's DBED and um, our state business opportunity and development program. So uh, I'm on my lunch hour, so I don't charge this to my, my, my state job. So uh, just stick with me. I can only be here a half hour, so pay attention. I'd like to start off with, um, I got some information this week from uh, a friend on the Big Island who has a professor friend on the mainland who did a great video series about how energy blind we are. And, and it really struck home because most of us don't really think about how much energy we consume every day. You know, we turn on lights, we turn off lights, we jump in our car, we move around. But we don't really take into consideration what it took to get the food to the grocery store, what it took to get the gasoline to the gas station, what it took to, you know, basically produce the electricity that runs in your house. And we really are kind of, not kind of, we're spoiled rotten with the amount of energy that we use to get things done. I mean, as a really quick example, I live on the windward side of Oahu, and it takes me like 15 minutes to drive over here in the morning because I leave kind of early. But if I had to walk over here, it'd be three or four hours. And if I got to ride a bike over here, it'd probably be an hour, you know, because I'd have to pedal uphill for a while, then I could coast downhill. But the, the relationship is important because, you know, if you, if you think about the definition of energy, um, it's neither created or destroyed, it just changes forms. So you have all kind of energy, solar, you know, uh, visual uh, spectrum, you have uh, sound, you have um, muscle movement, you have kinetic energy, you have heat energy, you have all kinds of energy, and it just changes forms. And we just take all this stuff for granted. So really, we all ought to start being more conscious about energy. I'll share with you a quick um, illustration that um, this guy had in a graphic form. He had a picture of himself on his farm, and he's standing in front of his horse, and his horse has behind it a quad, and behind the quad is his truck. And he says, I am one-tenth horsepower. And my horse is one horsepower. And my quad is 40 horsepower. And my truck is like 260 horsepower. And he, what he's telling you is, I can only do one-tenth of the work of my horse, you know, in terms of amount of work done in a limited amount of, in a certain amount of time. But all the way up to his truck, that's doing 260 times what his horse can do. So comparing him to his truck is a huge gap in capability and how much energy that you, you need to have to do the work of a human being compared to the, the typical vehicle that we take for granted. So one of the ways that you handle um, conserving energy and trying to be cleaner and greener is to be efficient in your personal transportation. And here in Hawaii, we have a great opportunity in downtown Honolulu called Biki or Bike Share Hawaii. And they do a great job of putting bikes out there for people like me who got my bike stolen and need to get around town. Um, and a bicycle is probably one of the most, if not the most efficient way to get around. In terms of speed and amount of energy you have to put in human power, it's extremely efficient. So we have with us today, uh, Justine and Todd from Bike Share Hawaii Viki, and they're gonna kind of get us up to date on uh, what's been going on in your world. So welcome. Aww. And if, if we can start off with, uh, I'll start off with Justine, just a little bit about how you got into Viki. And, and then Todd, and then we'll, we'll get into some more in-depth discussion. Yeah, sure. So Beaky was launched in 2017, but really the concept of bringing bike share into Honolulu started back in 2008, um, 2010. There was a, a pilot system in Kailua. It was just a two-station system just to kind of really introduce Hawaii to the concept. Uh, that was there for a couple of years, and as that was happening, the, kind of those larger scale systems were kind of popping up all over the U.S. And so Honolulu was actually one of the last cities to get uh, kind of a, a larger scale system, but it was great. So we were piloting one, but then we still got all the lessons learned and got to do a lot of research of systems that really kicked it off. Um, and I've been a part of the team doing some grant writing. Uh, we are a nonprofit. Um, so we did the fundraising and the planning and the branding, um, which took a lot of outreach initially to really introduce that concept into the community get folks ready for it. And then um, as soon as we launched, we were lucky enough to also be, because of our partnership with the Department of Transportation Services, we had access to uh, federal TAP funding, mm -hmm. transportation alternative program funding. So that funding allowed us to expand, um, really uh, just about a year and a half later, expand our system by 30%. Wow. 
which is super exciting. And, and one of the things that I love to emphasize about Honolulu and our system, um, kind of the original leadership, it was really important to them when we launched the system, it had to have that ultimate utility. So we didn't want to do, okay, let's start with 30 stations and see how it goes and go to 50 stations. It was really important, like, we got to go big and it's got to have the ultimate utility. And so it was 100 stations, which sometimes I think it was hard for some folks that didn't, um, we couldn't reach everyone in terms of keeping people really informed about what this was, how this was going to go, but it allowed us to have the utility that means in our first year, in the first calendar year, 2018, I believe we had a million and 7,000 trips, a little bit over a million trips, and 65% of those were Hawaii residents using wow. it, which is really cool. Most cities see something more like 80% visitors, 20% mm -hmm. uh, residents. And I really think that was the key of launching with that utility. So it's been awesome to, to have that launch and then continue to grow with the, the resources and the partnership. So it sounds like BG took good advantage of your experience prior to coming over to BG in Kailua. Yeah, yeah really I feel I really I inserted myself. I was I was doing <laughs> that program and you then I was like stalking. I was right yeah stalking. Oh, That's exactly. You were an <laughs> yes, but I was like writing grants and I was like Ben and Lori, I wrote you a grant. They're like oh we'll keep this this little girl around. So I just like inserted myself and then right before we launched I got this full-time position of, of grants and programs. Manager. How so. about you Todd? What, what got you into BG? Actually Biki brought me back. I had been shipwrecked here after the Peace Corps in the Philippines. Ended up going to UH Department of Urban Regional Planning in the 90s um, and then got frustrated with where bicycling and green transportation was in the 90s in Honolulu. So I left Honolulu to do car sharing and traffic calming and pedestrian black spot studies in the Pacific Northwest and bike parking throughout the nation and mm. went to Abu Dhabi with Alta. Mm. And then I was brought back by Beaky based on my transportation skills in the public and private side. And because a lot of what we do is, you know, is in the public realm, you know, talking to people about putting stations in parking spaces, in parking lots, and other locations. You need to be savvy, but also on the public sector and private sector side. Right. Yeah, you have to do it smart. And I, I appreciate the time it took to pull all this together because you know, I watched it as it was maturing. And as you went through all the planning and coordinating with the city and where you're going to put the bikes and where you're going to put the racks. And the community, and, too. Yeah, and coordinating. I mean, you take up parking stalls in front of the business. They're not real happy. You know, so you have to coordinate all that and make sure it's done right. And it's a lot of work, permitting, mm -hmm. um, studies. You know, a lot of business to the legislature to make sure people understand what you're doing. I think um, most people don't realize that for every Beaky station that's out there, we probably went through at least 10 locations before that one was approved. Well, Justine, why don't we get started with a couple of images that you brought and, and talk to them. So if we could bring up the first graph and uh, talk a little bit about that one. Yeah, so this one's exciting to just really show uh, our growth. Again, because we had that, that large system size, we really kicked it off, I think, at launch, we already had the rides per bike per day kind of industry standard about, I think it was like 2.7. 2. Oh, 2 1, 1. 1. Yeah, the, is, average is the, the nation, standard. Yeah. So we were already exceeded that as soon as we mm -hmm. launched. And it kind of felt like, okay, this is maybe just the excitement, people trying it out, but it has just continued to grow. And it's, I think everyone's blown away by that utility. In 2018, it was announced that um, for the last calendar year, even though Beaky had only been in existence for six months at the time, but the utilization ranked um, Beaky as the eighth most heavily used bike share system in mm. the country. So wow. it's definitely like getting attention across the nation, which is which is really cool. That's and as you can news. see, that just continues to grow. Yeah. Um, I think we've had we still have record months, obviously with the the increase in the uh, system size. But if you look at October 2000. 17, we had about 60,000 trips, and October of 2018, we had about 100,000 trips. Yeah. So what, that's like a 60% increase, and similar for December. So that growth has just been exponential and really exciting. I mean, I think what Beaky is showing, you know, we're taking a million, we're adding a million bicycle trips to the urban street grid, and we're, but we're taking off vehicle trips. Yeah. So I think the key takeaway for that is, you know, we're converting people that can have a choice. You know, if you live in Kaka'ako and only need to go a mile for a quart of milk, mm -hmm. by you converting your car trip to a Beaky trip, then you're freeing up that parking stall and that street space for someone from the Windward side or the Kapolei side to right. come into town. 
Right. One thing I like to talk about too in terms of, you know, you have your service area, so it's like here's where the people can use it, you know, the people that live here and work here. But what's been unique about our system is in terms of our membership options. We have uh, the monthly plan for mm -hmm. folks that are could maybe use it every day or live by it or, or work by it. But we have also what we call the free spirit plan, which is a bank of 300 minutes that you can use in any increment. And I think that's what's also allowed folks that live on the North Shore, on the West Side, over in Hawaii Kai, they have that uh, plan that gives them that flexibility. So even if they use it only once a month or mm -hmm. just for work errands, it gives them a way to do that, you know, without having to commit to a monthly plan mm -hmm. or the, the single ride. So I'm happy that we have that Because the minutes don't expire that month. Right. You, can, you can use it, dip into it over a series of uh, several months. And or you year can recharge it too. Yep. Okay. Well, let's throw up that second graphic too and take a peek at that. Um, you can talk about that one. Yeah, so this is some of the, the demographics we've been able to collect of who our members are. So if you can see that kind of uh, our biggest age grouping there is 18 to 34 and, and 35 to 49. We do have a great percentage of, of folks that are over um, 50. And this is the kind of data that I like to see because as a, a nonprofit, we also have a really community-driven mission to, you know, deliver on the community benefits that bike share, we know in terms of uh, reducing energy and um, imports of oil, increasing opportunities for physical activity. And I think right now we're still at that piece where the, the people that kind of get it right away are gonna be drawn to it and gonna be using it. And that's that age demographic of you know, 18 to 35. How, how important is the data that you just put up for things like grant writing you know, to make sure? I that mean, that's, that's key for me, you know? Uh, a lot of our original grants were about outreach, let's educate about the concept, and mm -hmm. now... The hope. Yeah. yeah, and now it's really, okay, here's what we've been able to hit, so here's what's kind of my next steps. And so, for example, one I always love to talk about is AARP. So there was an opportunity, um, they had a grant opportunity, and so we did a number of rides and really targeted outreach for folks over 50. You know, our city has this uh, age-friendly city initiative, um, making sure people can age in place, the complete streets, making sure these projects, you know, even when we're talking about bike infrastructure, that it's for a wide span of people. And so mm -hmm. I, I feel like it's my responsibility to, to see these initiatives and find these funding opportunities that make sure we can target the folks that aren't naturally drawn to it. You know, with the older folks, I realize some of the initial barriers is the technology. You know, these, these stations can be kind of intimidating. And mm -hmm. so it kind of, it kind of killed me that, you know, it's, we're so widespread and the fact that some people are looking at these and say, oh, this isn't for me. I don't know yeah. how to do this. And so we use some grant funding to partner with AARP to reach that demographic so we mm. could do some really like hands-on tutorials. I mean, I showed them how to download an app and then just getting them back on a bike after they hadn't been on yeah. a bike in 20 years or 30 years. And then it's just something they can do either for fun or just to get that physical exercise. Mm. And just, I think, to feel a part of the community and these things that are happening, like Complete Streets, like more bike infrastructure. Yeah, I almost, tell people I'm an I'm a analog brain in a digital world, so I, I get that outreach part really well. Well, it's actually, and also it's flipped generationally. Mm -hmm. as, as Justine has mentioned, you know, the, the electronic digital interface for the older generation is the barrier, but not the bicycling. Right. And mm -hmm. what we're seeing in some cases, it's the opposite for the youth. Yeah. They know the digital, but yeah. it's the analog. They are not and as savvy about like cycling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so on that note, if you looked at our, our demographic, our demographic span again. We didn't even have, you have to be, you can be 16 and yeah. over. Um, so prob based on that info here, we don't even have 16 on there. So less than 12% definitely uh, between 16 and 18. But to me, that's such a key age. If, yeah. I mean, that's when you're super in impressionable. Yeah. And so if we can get that age demographic excited about bike share and just understanding it, and they can, you know, ask for a bike share membership instead of a car, right. I think in terms of that financial burden that gets lifted off of their yeah. family and of well, course that independence and well additionally um, you know what the Dutch have found is that drivers cycle cyclists as drivers are better drivers because yeah. they've been vulnerable in the street and if we can get those skills early on in youth drivers you know Kuliana then they'll be a better driver later on that's a good concept and I'll, I'll talk about that when we come back from our break because we take a quick break here for think tech to talk about some of their other shows but uh, I was just down in Australia, and oh. they had an interesting concept on the same thing. So we'll see you in 60 seconds. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on ThinkTech Hawaii. 
My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go Beyond the Lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha and mabuhai. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming salamat po. Mabuhay and aloha. Hey, thanks for joining us on Stan Energy Man this beautiful Friday in Hawaii. And um, on my lunch hour, if I hadn't mentioned that in the past. Um, so we're here with the uh, Beaky folks, and we were talking about how kids that are educated on bikes in traffic become better drivers when they're adults. And, and I was going to explain to you that my wife and I went on a vacation down to New Zealand and Australia um, last year. And what they have is they have little parks that are actually set up as regular streets, but they're for kids on scooters Whoa. and stuff. And the kids have to follow stop signs and street lights and stop for emergency I vehicles. Did a child and, in London. Yeah, and, and so they actually have kids riding their bikes and their scooters and stuff on these little things when they're just little toddlers to learn the basics of, of how to ride. And um, I think that's something I haven't seen a lot in the U.S. But it'd there are be a few programs thing. in the West Coast. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be great to have some, some in Hawaii, because I certainly haven't seen some in Hawaii. But. Well, I do want to make a plug for our partners, Hawaii Bicycling League. Okay. So they do uh, bike ed in elementary school, fourth grade. So they are getting in there at that young age Good. to kind of teach them how to ride a bike and get Good. that kind of exposure. But they're, they're on their second generation, I think, of students. You know, they've, they've oh. done the parents of current bike ed members. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. important because, I mean, we I don't know if we teach driver's ed anymore, if it's mandatory. It was mandatory when I was growing up here. In school. Mm -hmm. and, and I see, I mean, this morning, classic example. I had a guy on the H3 pass me on the shoulder lane. Oh, my God. And, you know, and, and we're doing 60 <laughs> miles an hour almost, you know, going uphill. And he must have been doing 80. And the, the lane on the left side of me is doing a little bit faster than me. He went zipping by three or four of us on the shoulder lane. And if I had just lost my concentration and drift a little bit, he didn't smack into the wall. Mm -hmm. He had no place to go. And, you know, that kind of stuff, we, we need to train our, our drivers better. And Beaky helps us. I don't get too yeah. far off track. No. So, Todd, tell us a little bit about, you know, maybe where the future is for Beaky. And not just in Honolulu or not just in downtown Honolulu, but as we get out into more of the rural areas or the more like West Oahu where it's kind of a developed community and, and actually designed for better bike uh, paths and things like that. Well, definitely, um, you know, I remember in, in planning school in the 90s when the second city, Kapolei, was being laid out, there was definitely that hope of providing a ready-built community with transit, bikeways, walkways, you know, some of them, the things we on the, in the city had forgotten to do. So Beaky is definitely looking to grow and continue to grow. You know, we're looking at Phase three, um, Kaimuki area. We're looking at uh, Puhi Palama, um, and we're also in discussions with uh, the city about Hart. You know, because they are laying out <coughs> with their sure. light rail stations when they're operational, um, parking spaces, parking areas for Beaky. Now, we do need you know Beaky stops, you know, outside the station areas too. So it is our hope that you know with the city um, slowly implementing its bike plan that there would be these um, on-street facilities, either protected or um, bike lanes, so that folks can drive, operate their Beaky from home to the transit station. Because that is really the hub and spoke and the, the, the model of a lot of bike share systems throughout the, the world. I haven't, I haven't been to UH very often. Are you guys in UH right now? We have six stations, okay. we, right. and, we, and we want, and our customers want more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we have them at KCC. There's 
Uh, there's one station on campus and two on just adjoining uh, the campus. Uh, actually, the one on campus is uh, used quite a bit more so than some of the UH uh, sites. Mm -hmm. HPU has been also a great um, partner. Uh, and there's stations surrounding their downtown campus. And, you know, I, I, I was just at the Foreign Trade Zone about a week and a half, two weeks ago, and there's a whole bunch of other bikes just kind of lined up there. And, and the guy who runs the Foreign Trade Zone is talking to us saying, hey, do you know anybody that wants a bunch of bikes? Because these guys haven't cleared with the city yet. They want to just put these bikes out. And I remember the scooter thing we had happen yeah. mm -hmm. a couple months ago, and that went over like a lead balloon. Um, okay, Vi, maybe you can use them? Huh? Yeah, <laughs> what, what is, what's, uh, your concept is, uh, you know, you pay to use the, the, right. the bikes, but you also maintain them and stuff, and, um, and they have docking stations where you go in and out of. Um, how do you guys view the, those other just kind of drop-and-go bikes? Well, actually, there's more to it than that. I mean, Justine can speak to this. Um, because in our initial startup, we did a lot of community discussion mm -hmm. and, and customer surveys about what features on the bike they wanted, you know, and the stations, dockless versus docked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when we had, I think it was in 2015, we did a, a demo day at the design center, and we had kind of our four finalists of equipment, and it was two dockless systems and two dock systems. And we had the community come in for a weekend, and they just voted on different features, and PBSC equipment, which is what we went with, is, was the overall favorite. Um, as we mentioned, Ben and Lori did a lot of initial research in those two years from the organization forming and launch. They did a lot of research. They got to travel to a couple different systems, kind of check out how they're doing. At that time, really, Dockless was um, pretty nascent. Yeah. yeah, new. You know, the Dock was pretty well established and was showing those benefits in those mm -hmm. cities. And I think when we thought about Honolulu and looked at it in terms of the space available, you know, you look at cities. I think like. Chicago and New York, and they have these super wide sidewalks, and they right. have that that furniture zone space. Mm -hmm. And Honolulu just doesn't have that, right. you know. So it just well, we used to, but it got converted into parking spots. Yeah. yeah. So it just made, in terms of the the palette for bike share at the time, and mm -hmm. the idea of it being organized, um, we just felt like Doc was was the way to go. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's been and a lot of that was trying to avoid being a problem. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. that's why we spend often six to nine months talking to the community before we put um, tiki stops in, mm -hmm. because we want to minimize that, in, that negative interaction that sometimes dockless has, because, you know, with, with customers, just, it's like shopping carts. Yeah, you know, when exactly. people leave shopping carts by the bus stop or in the sidewalk, those are, you know, those are daily negative impacts. Mm -hmm. um, but... And when we talk about how these systems are being used, you know, we, our membership data, we can see, you know, 50% are using Beaky to get to work. 50% of our, our members that responded mm -hmm. to our survey are using it to get to work. And so that dependability, uh, you know, when I've uh, tried yeah. dockless in, in other cities and in Florence, it was like, okay, I want to use a bike, but okay, I have no idea where it is. You know, it has the app, but if you're with a group of people, just that idea of the dependency, mm -hmm. I felt that dock-based systems have been able to provide that. Well, and additionally, because the, the docks are there, people go to them, either on their foot or on a beaky, and then they discover more businesses. But back to the dockless versus docks. So the two, technology, the two operational models have their advantages. I mean, so for the built, dense urban form, the dock systems are a, a better way of managing the, the sharing of the public mm -hmm. realm. Now, dockless works very well in low-density areas, maybe resort communities, maybe, you know, maybe Kailua may have been a better dockless system or, you know, Papale or um, those areas where you may have fewer users depending on the bike and more wide open spaces. Have you um, um, had any surprises, good or bad? I mean, what, do you find, like, is vandalism a problem or is um, theft a problem? Actually, or? actually, that's been a positive surprise. I mean, there's almost daily stories of us getting calls to the call center saying, you know, this beaky shouldn't be here, and people calling in it. I mean, some of that's early adopter syndrome, but it's mm -hmm. also, I think the community really has a lot of aloha for beaky. Yeah. Yeah, we would get calls in. They saw a blue bike in the back of a truck headed on the highway, <laughs> and then we end up it's sending our guys number. out to Waipahu, and it's like, nope, it's just a blue bike. But yeah, okay. Thank you so much for Thanks letting for us calling. know. Thank yeah. You. Yeah, my wife has a blue bike. I get to tell her to be pretty open. Yeah. She even has a basket on the front, too, so. Yeah. Yes, I mean, it's almost, it's almost a daily activity. Just yeah. people calling them in and we bring them back. Sometimes, you know, it's almost like the, they go on a little holo holo trip. Mm. Okay. 
Have you had any, uh, any really big surprises? I mean, impressive things where, I know your ridership has actually been probably one of the biggest, but, um, you know, it, that, and that's an encouragement. I mean, it seems like, you know, taking from that and the amount of time you take to approaching the community and getting their input makes it successful. Um, I, well, I think the biggest surprise, the positive surprise, has been people anecdotally telling us that, you know, they do have a guaranteed <coughs> car parking stall at work, but they leave their car when they're at work, they take Beaky out for yeah. errands, meetings, yeah. and, and Pauhana trips because it's just quicker. Yeah, that's, that's what I did with my bike before it was stolen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On that same note, I think one of the talking points I received a lot when I would, before Bike Share launched was, we don't need Bike Share in Honolulu. Everyone who wants to bike already has a bike. And I think probably over half of our members do have their own bike. Mm -hmm. And I think what I've been surprised Prize is just the, the actuality of people using it for just an option, you know, the mm -hmm. idea of having it as a one-way possibility. And it's not about getting rid of your car. It's not yeah. about getting rid of your other bike. And people get that now, which is really great. Well, I mean, as a bike owner and rider, it's a hassle to bust, bust out a chain, find a pole. I've had security guards in this building, by the way, tell me, oh, you can't park your bike there. You know, I mean, where is the rack? It's a hassle. Yeah, where's yeah. the bike rack? And for you this need building? three locks. Yeah. You need a U lock, yeah. and you need like three of the yeah. other and, ones. And when mine was stolen, it had five feet of pretty good chain from Home Depot and a pretty hard padlock, and it was figure eighted through two loops on a bike rack in my building. Yeah, and they still came by with bolt cutters, and it's gone. Well, that's know? assuming you can even park your bike in your building. Most, like I live in a 1960s building, the bike room is a, it's a nightmare, and yet they won't let us bring our bikes into our apartments right. unless we you know, go up nine or 10 stories on the stairs. Um, my neighbor's bike was just stolen yesterday in their parking yeah. stall. So I think that is the key. I mean, not having a bike or the, uh, the difficulty of, of maintaining a bike has been a bigger barrier. Yes. Um, and that's what Beaky's broken. I mean, if you go out on any downtown street corner during um, peak morning commute or afternoon commute, Sometimes we found out that half the bikes passing by are beakies. Yeah. And then in the off hours, sometimes we've seen four times as many beakies. And so that's, well, that helps because it's safety in numbers. The more, bikes, the more times you see a pedestrian or bike in a street, drivers tend to respect them more. Yeah, true. Well, we're down to our last 60 seconds or so. I don't want to leave that time to you folks to you know, close up here with what you think is important or what you'd like to send out as a message to the community. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say in my work, I'm always just looking for partnerships and ideas that can help integrate bike share into the community with other groups. I'm actually really excited. Today was, uh, this week was volunteer week uh, that Kanu was hosting. So we partnered with Meals on Wheels to connect our Beaky members to deliver, to, deliver to be first time volunteers for Meals on Wheels, and mm. they're out delivering meals on Beaky's cool. today. So we did that Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And it's just a cool way to help other organizations kind of build their volunteer base and just kind of look for those creative ways to collaborate. So that's always cool. And I'll pitch for sponsorship. You know, we, we are always looking for new relationships with Hawaii businesses. Um, we have a new feature coming on our app called Beaky Bites. So if you're in a neighborhood, it'll, it'll drive our members to restaurants and other services with uh, you know, appropriate discount. Uh, and additionally, um, people, especially in the, the restaurant business and supermarket business, should think of themselves as our fuel depots. Because, um, you know, Beaky may be hydrogen, hydrogen powered. I yeah. say it's banana powered. So. OK, well, I still think it's hydrogen powered. But that's a <laughs> less filling, taste greats kind of discussion yeah. we'll have later. But thanks for being here, both of you. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks for joining us on the Stand the Energy Man this week. And uh, just remember, it's either bananas or hydrogen, but Beaky is powered by something, and it ain't electricity. So get out yeah, yeah. there and, and get a Beaky and, uh, and zook around Honolulu. We'll see you next Friday on Stanley Energy. Aloha. Aloha.